a hard thing isn't a bad thing. You know, and when we embrace those hard things, we learn to be very passionate about something. We learn to be very good at it. And even if we fail at it, it's no big deal. It's just a failure. Just we learn something new. And just look at today. What can you do today? How can you move your needle forward? Hey, everyone. This is Rod Kate, and welcome to this week's episode of Rocket Motivation. This week's guest is a mother of two, a wife, an author, and someone who's been pushed to her limit and did not break. She's going to talk about her year from hell and how when she got to her breaking point, she discovered her strength and how to push through. This is going to be a great episode of Resilience and Never Quit Attitude. Jennifer Smith, welcome to Rocket Motivation. Thank you. So Jennifer, why don't we do this? Let's start with bringing everybody up to speed, where you are in your life now, what do you do, family, where you live, just bring us up to speed. Well, I live in Mobile, Alabama, on the Gulf Coast. We are developing a business, and uh, my husband's in construction now. Uh, my kids, my oldest is going into middle school, and my youngest is finishing her last year of elementary school. We are plugging along and just building life that's, you know, building a life is not as easy as it sometimes as we want to make it sound. But, you know, we had to start over from scratch, completely over, just at zero, and uh, so that's what we've been doing for the past two years. Well, let's go back to that, the, the starting from scratch and back to zero. So let's go back to 2018. Yes. You know, we've talked before the show and you described that as, as your as the year from hell. Mm-hmm. Kind of give us a, a, the thumbnail sketch of what happened that year. You know, we were just this normal, everyday you know, family of four, two dogs, you know, house, car payments. Then one day my husband came home and he said, uh, in about three months, we're out of a job. And I went, uh, what? <laughs> and uh, he announced that the pharmacy was closing. He had no idea what he was going to do next. No plan, just that, you know, what he had been doing for the past 20 years was done. And I went, okay, well, we've got savings. I mean, you're a, a highly qualified individual. He was sought after all over the country. Uh, people as far away from as Australia would call him and ask him for help in figuring out problems with compounding pharmacy related issues. And and I was like, well, we'll be fine. And, and let me just break in because and because he, he was a, a technician and he worked in a compounding pharmacy and I the, the business basically went away. It wasn't yeah. something he did. That business just overnight. Just, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. All right. And so, so he and your husband's name's Josh, right? Yes. So Josh loses. His, I mean, it, that's coming. Sole source of income. Right. Okay. Yeah. We had made the decision that I would stay home with our kids. Uh, that year, my son had been diagnosed with dyslexia and that he could not learn the alphabet. I mean, just trying to memorize the alphabet song was so difficult for him. And so, you know, that decision was probably one of the greatest decisions we'd ever made because it allowed me to be in that school daily if I needed to be to help or just to to be on point with him to figure out what was going on and to figure out how I could be a part of it and help. And then uh, we were watching my daughter coming up, you know, that year too and looking at it going, wow, she's exhibiting the same symptoms. You know, now we've got two kids that are needing high end, you know, very high end tutoring, which was about, oh God, $700 a month. And, uh, you know, and we're looking at no jobs, no income going, all right, well, what do we do? You know, so we, we had about six months of savings, you know, that we were we would be okay as long as we were very careful with what we did. And uh, and I thought, well, you know, if need be, I can go back to work too. You know, I can, surely we can find something. But surely, I mean, Josh is going to find a job. You know, I mean, that's like a given. You know, he's high, you know, this is what he can do is chemistry, physics, uh, math all rolled into one. You know, any job that requires that, Josh can do. But but he doesn't. But he doesn't. He, he doesn't. He has a hard time. <laughs> okay, and, and so then you get some health problems. Yes. So uh, there we are. We're you know we're trying to sending out. I think by the end of it, we'd probably sent out eight thousand applications and resumes, and had two interviews. Just two. We're down to a couple hundred dollars. Going all right. And I woke up this one morning and I have this really weird pea-sized shaped nodule underneath my chin. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's acne? What is that? And I'm like, hmm. Didn't think much of it. You know, just kind of kept going. About a week later, it's a little bigger and it's a little bit more annoying. And I'm going, all right, I need to call the doctor and get in. Like, there's something weird. And uh, two weeks goes by and I finally get to my doctor and she looks at me and she goes, I don't want to touch that. You probably need to go to the ER. I, I don't know what that is. And I, I'm stumped. And I'm like, all right. I, I decided to go to urgent care first because I thought, well, maybe they can do something better, you know. And the urgent care doctor goes, 
no, you need to go home and pack a bag. You're going to the hospital. And I was like, don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. Be prepared for a few days. And I was like, well, what is this? And he goes, it's something called Ludwig's angina. And he goes, it's fine. I don't want you Googling it. Just go to the ER. I will call them and tell you. In fact, I'm mad I'm not even at the ER for you. And I'm like, okay. He goes, it's very rare. Uh, I arranged for my kids to be picked up from school. They have no idea mom's going to the hospital. I'm not really sick. I'm not having symptoms. You know, I just have this weird swelling under my chin. And what it was is that a lymph node, bacteria somehow got into the lymph node and it was swelling. And what it, it does is it'll swell to the point where it cuts your trachea off. So you have no ability to breathe. And, you know, there's no blood supply to that lymph node. So it's hard to get medication into it. Uh, the only way to do it is to flood your system with IV antibiotics. And so they're like, all right, you're going straight to the ER. ER doctor meets me in the room and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> like I used to work in an ER. I'm like, I know that that's not a good sign. So for the next six hours, you know, an ENT specialist is called in, the surgeon is called in. And of course, my husband, being in the medical field that he is, looks it up and goes, you have an 87% chance you're going to die. And, uh, you know, so we had, a, I kind of let that sink in for a second. All right, look, Josh, let's have a conversation of what do you do if I don't make it out of this? And then he gives me his answer and I went, oh, no, you're not. No, 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 no. And, uh, and so I kind of made him get lost and I was like, go look at your, our kids, make sure they know that mom's okay. And then I thought, I'm going, I'm going to write a letter. You know, I'm going to make sure my husband has my words of what I want done, at least for the first year, if I don't make it out of this. And uh, 26 rounds of IB antibiotics. About five days later, I did make it out. And, and also to add to the story is you were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis from a young age. Yes. Swelling for me is a really already a problem. And so having a disease like that or an infection that's going to cause swelling was just double worrying some. I kind of take that into account and I'm like, well, I don't really want to be scared. I just want to be prepared. So we're past the point of the infections gotten under control. And I, I go home and I'm finally like the infectious disease doctors are like, look, you have no immune system right now. I mean, we just basically killed it in order to kill this one thing, you know, inside your system. And I'm like, great. He goes, no Walmart, no Walgreens, no Winn-Dixie, no grocery stores, no public schools. Stay out of the school for God's sake. You know, I'm like, what? You know, and so, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm needing to be in the school with my kids. And, you know, I can't go in there because it's the, literally it's more infectious than a hospital. And so uh, the doctors, you know, very clear. They're like, probably about six months. I can't work. You know, I can't help Josh. In, in the course of Josh trying to find work, he's doing anything that comes his way. Any kind of small job, any kind of lawn care job, anything to make money. And the money's dwindling. Oh, the money ran out in the hospital. And uh, so I go home and... You know, I mean, at that point, all I could really do was just recover. I mean, my system was hit so hard. My arthritis flares up. Everything's flared. And about six weeks later, I at least can go get the kids. I can pick them up from school. I woke up that morning and just I saw like I had dried blood underneath my fingernails. And my head was wet. Like the back of my neck was just wet. So I took a shower. It was still wet, you know. And I called the doctor and left a message, you know, because, you know, they, they don't return. You know, they're not exactly on the phone right away. And I picked my kids up from school, and then she finally calls me back that night. And she said, explain what's going on to me. And so I, I said, you know, I've got something's like oozing out of my scalp. Like, it's just my back of my neck's wet. And she you know, made me take a picture and sent it to her. And she's like, oh, my God. And she goes, we need to call in some antifungals and steroids. And, and I went, you want to put me on two steroids? And she goes, well, yeah. And I said, you know, I have, you, you've always told me not to do that unless it's life-threatening because of a family history with steroids. And she goes, yeah, I did say that. And I went, okay, explain that. And she said, well, Jennifer, if your kids hug your neck right now and they haven't washed their hands, I mean, they're, I think they're like eight and seven at the time, you're dead in 12 hours because you have an open wound on your brainstem from the antibiotics. And they created a fungal infection that was just for some reason had picked that spot as the spot that it was going to come out in. And I'm going, oh, Landon did that in carpool line four hours ago. And he has black fingernails always because he's a little boy and, you know, he doesn't wash his hands. No matter how many times I tell him to turn around and go wash his hands, you know, he doesn't do it. And he'd been in that elementary school and that's eight hours. And she goes, Jennifer, I'm going to call you in eight hours and I expect you to pick up the phone. And I went, okay. And she goes, she knew I used a lot of essential oils and, and it was very holistic in how I approached my arthritis. And she goes, everything that you've ever learned about antimicrobials and all those you know, oils that say that they can help with that, use them, all of them. And I went, okay, sure, I'll do that. That I was kind of cooking dinner and just kind of contemplating that and 
what do you do with eight hours left? And she, you know, her comment was, your body won't know it's been hit. It'll just be lights out. You just won't wake up. So if the essential oils don't work, I just won't wake up in the morning. And my son will be the one who killed me. And eventually he's going to figure that out because he's a smart little kid. And I thought, oh, God, you know, what, how, how, can I, how can I leave a part of myself behind if I don't wake up the next morning? And I wrote letters to both my kids. Uh, was very intentional with uh, different, you know, milestones that I thought they would want to hear something from me. And, you know, I tried my very best to think through that in, in just those few hours, let it, you know, and uh, spent time with them, just was very intentional with how I put them to bed and the you know, time stories I told them and, you know, just loving on them and was very aware of just what I had, all of the things I had done thus far and all the things I had always said I wanted to do. And it wasn't necessarily that I had regrets. It was just an awareness, you know, very of how precious life was and, and how much I, I loved my family and how even though we were going through this horrible, hard thing, it wasn't them. It wasn't Josh's fault. It wasn't my fault. And the, and the grace that we had for each other and the love that we were, you know, still pouring out on each other as we're going through this. And, you know, and I, I definitely had a moment of this isn't fair. <laughs> you know, I don't want this to happen. And I remember I, I, I said the Lord's Prayer that night and just, it was like, I just kind of surrendered. And I was like, well, I either wake up in the morning or I don't. And uh, the next morning I did wake up and I was like, whoa. And my doctor, true to form at eight o'clock, you know, like eight hours on the dot, she called me and she goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> You know, and uh, she told me later, she said that she had zero, zero hope of that, of that. She really thought Josh would be the one answering, going, hey, I can't wait to never up. It wasn't like I had this life altering, shattering moment of, oh, I'm going to do my bucket list or, you know, I'm going to change everything about it. But everything became very intentional for me. Like I, it, it disrupted my thought process. And I remember Josh kind of was off that day. He just kind of, it was like a Saturday, I think. And he looked at me and said, hey, you want to watch Netflix? And I was like, no. I don't at all. <laughs> I have no desire to spend my time watching Netflix. And he kind of looked at me and was like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm like, no, let's let's go for a hike. You know, and, and he's looking at me like, what? You know, like, um, you just kind of survived this whole really crazy thing. You know, and he's like, maybe you stay indoors, you know, with your germs. I mean, speaking of doing stuff that's intentional, I know. So even at this point, Josh is still looking for a job. Money's tight. The one thing you knew you could do that I think you embarked on was completely cleaning your house. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah. Like we have this 12 foot ceiling house, this old midtown, you know, built in like the 1890s, I think, or something like that. And maybe I could just clean it out. Not, not like, I mean, it was cluttered, you know, it was clean up, you know, ish, you know, as far as picked up and it wasn't like it was crazy. It was just, let me clean it out so that maybe it can run efficiently and effectively. So I'm not spending so much of my time cleaning a house over and over and over and over again. And I, so I started in one corner and I thought, oh, this will take me about a week, you know, and uh, literally started in the one corner, pulled everything away from that corner and thought, do, and it kind of almost like Marie kondo it, kind of like it was like, do I love this? No. You know, do I need this? Yes. <laughs> you know, and and one of the things I kept saying to myself, because it took a lot longer than a week, it took about 46 days and 27 trips to Goodwill and uh, lots of time on Facebook Marketplace selling stuff. And I thought, I can't work, I can't be in public, but I can help my family by making sure that our home is embracing when they walk in. There's not a to-do list way staring at them in the form of dishes and, and junk and, and, you know, piles of stuff. It's just a smooth and that just became a very big priority for me because I knew my husband loved it when he would walk in because it was just, oh, you know, I, I, I can breathe. My kids did too. And so we started doing that. And at the end of the, it was like day 43. And I have the house, everything is cleaned out except the closet. And so I'm, I'm, it's taken me three days to clean this closet out, get everything out of it, wipe it all down, put stuff back in, organize it. And I had asked my husband to go through this one little box and because I opened it and I was like, all right, this is all your stuff. Like, I can't go through it for you. This is yours. And of course, three days later, he hadn't touched it. And I, I finished the, that closet and I put the last bit of, of hanging clothes back in it. And, a, you know, true to the Gulf Coast, a storm just formed right over our heads and just thundered you know, straight through the sky. And boom, you know, this huge downpour, you know, a couple inches in an hour. And it starts raining in the closet on top of my head. Yeah, you finished this 46-day odyssey of cleaning your house, and then you're rewarded with the big, 
your house is leaking and here comes the water. Mm-hmm. I mean, is this your breaking point? Oh, yeah. It's always a little thing that gets you, right? It's just all these big things. And I have it broken. And I'm like, we're going to be fine. We're going to troop through this. I've done all this work for my family. And then the, the roof just starts randomly leaking. The one moment that I finally had accomplished something big. And, uh, and I closed the door on the closet, turned the light off, and just kind of backed myself against until I hit something and sunk to the floor. And I, and I said, you know, God, if something doesn't give, I'm going to break in half. I don't know what else to do. I am at a loss. What else am I supposed to do? And my daughter found me, and she didn't say anything. She just kind of looked at me and walked past me and walked into Josh and said, there's something wrong with mom. And uh, Josh came up to me, and he's like, are you okay? What's going on? I, I just, I, I really didn't have words. I just shook my head and just was I'm just, I don't know what I can quit. I mean, it's not like I can quit my family. I mean, I could, but then I wouldn't have a family anymore, you know? And, and I was like, I'm done. During this time, are you also writing a book? Yes. Okay. Tell us about the book. So the book started out as kind of a way to process some stuff that was happening to a friend of mine who had lost her child. And two-year-old child, a little girl that wasn't much younger than my little girl. And she had asked me, she said, for a while, I need you to be my friend, but don't expect me to be yours. And I said, okay, I can do that for you. And, you know, it is not an easy thing to sit next to a friend that is literally your worst nightmare as a parent and watch her and talk to her and listen to her story and, and, and not want to run away. And I didn't want to run away from her. I didn't want to um, abandon her in that time. But I also didn't know what to do with my feelings about what was happening. And so I started just kind of journaling and just started creatively writing very much in secret. I didn't really want it to be something that anybody knew about or I didn't even tell my husband I was doing it. And it kind of just created this story in and of itself. And I was a part of the Writers Guild here in Mobile learning about writing. You know, I'm, I'm dyslexic myself that I learned once my kids were diagnosed. And so I was really trying to learn more. And the story just kind of took on a life of its own. And so I created it where it's a Navy SEAL who falls in love with a woman who's lost her family. And I wanted a warrior to tell that story because I wanted it to be through the eyes of someone who could respect that kind of um, adversity and overcoming something so big and life shattering. And, and I started, you know, I just wanted to be able to to make someone walk in their shoes, you know, and, and to, to see that loss and that grief for what it was. And, and I remember she told me once, my friend told me, she said, you know, it's like the worst part is doing it alone and of grieving alone. And, you know, I wrote that into the book. And I, I, when my husband finally found it one day, because I was laughing at something I'd written because I hadn't seen it in a while. And, and he's like, well, what are you laughing at? And I was like, oh, nothing. You know, I was like, I, you know, this is like this little thing I had done. I just wasn't very confident in it at all. And he goes, well, now I have to know, you know, and I finally let him read it. And he's like, oh, gosh, Jen, this is good. He's like, I hate romance crap. And you cooked me. And he goes, you need to turn this into a book. And I was like, well, I don't know anything about the seals. I mean, that was just like what I knew was just from Hollywood, you know, it's just kind of using them as a vehicle. And he's like, well, what can you do to learn? And I was like, I don't know, read books, I guess. Anything I could find that talked about the seals, you know, if the seals wrote it or anything like that, I'd, I would start reading and just no idea how long it was going to take me. I had no idea what I was in for. I just was learning. And so one of the books, my guest on last week's show was Tom Shea and Navy Seal. And that's part of the reason why you're on th- this week's show. Mm-hmm. One of the books that you, I guess, got f- for your research purposes on Navy Seals was Tom's book, Unbreakable. Okay. Um, I found it in the box that Josh I had asked my husband to go through in the closet. Uh, I have no memory of buying it whatsoever. I don't and I don't buy books very often because, you know, I'm dyslexic, and so I don't necessarily like to read as often as I should. And uh, I don't remember it at all. But I had just literally said to the Lord, I said, you know, I, I'm going to break in half if something doesn't give. And so Josh grabs the box, and he's like, look, I'll help you. I can, I, I'll go through the box right now. And he, I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, and he pulls out this book and it's this little blue book. And he goes, hmm, well, maybe you should add that to your research for your book. And he throws it on the bed towards me and I'm like, and I read the title and I remember I literally said this out loud. And of course, my husband had no reference for it. And I said, oh God, that is not what I meant because the title said Unbreakable in Navy Seal's Way of Life. You know, and just the title alone and just of what I had just said, I'm like, there is no way. <sighs> so you read the book. Read the book that night. Tom, I love his writing. He's kind of dry-witted sometimes, but like I I'd read so many SEAL books at that point that I kind of had some understanding of what he was talking about and was 
thoroughly in, like invested in this book once I started reading it. And he made me laugh so many times. I snorted bourbon through my nose <laughs> when I was, you know, drinking a little bit that night. And I was like, because Tom talked about in that book a walk that he had learned to do. And it's called the 24-hour walk. And he had to do it three times before he was successful at it. And I remember thinking, gosh, what do you have to do in order to do something like that? And why would you want to do something like that? That's a little, really, I mean, it's a simple thing, but that's a hard thing to do is to walk all night long. And I went to bed kind of going, eh, you know, it's about four o'clock in the morning because he'd really held my attention well. And I finally put the book down because I couldn't stay awake any longer. And I dreamed that night that I went on the walk and that on the walk that I had learned so much about myself and the resolve that was needed to continue to overcome adversity that we were facing, the obstacles we were facing. And for me, arthritis, with my arthritis, I was like, I mean, I don't know if I could do that. And so that, that morning I woke, I, I, in the dream, I finished the walk. And at the end, I was ready to rock. Like, I mean, there was nothing that stood in my way. And I woke up going, oh man, how, what do I have to do to be ready for something like that? And so I started swimming laps and just within a month was at 1,000, 1,500 yards a week, a, a day, I mean, sorry, a day, which was five days a week. I did a, a relay race for a triathlon and just did the swimming part. And it was just, wow. You know, I kind of, you know, was blown away at what I could do when I stopped looking at my arthritis as a limitation. What was it about Tom's book that got you to where you went from, you know, basically not much physical activity to becoming a triathlete? I think initially one of the things that I liked about his book the most, what I connected to was the writing letters to your kids thinking you're going to not come home. And I think that for me kind of, it was something that I was like, I had just done that. Um, and so there was a part of me that just trusted Tom and what he was trying to do. You know, like it wasn't a, a ploy. It wasn't trying to get money out of me. He genuinely felt this was something that he wanted for his children experience. And then I, I kind of came into that and went, well, if that's good enough for his kids, you know, like I, it's, maybe there's something to this, you know, and the walk, the dream that I had, I wanted to go on that walk so bad. I couldn't tell you why, because I was like, I don't know what that's going to do to me, but I want to do that. Every time in life we had a bad day, if, you know, Josh got rejected again, because uh, at this point, I think we're 12 months into no job. And so every day that is hard, I would read more of his book. I'd read it over again, you know, and the day that I finished it and it was the end and I started crying because I just, I didn't want it to end because it was so encouraging for what we were going through. Yes, it's hard, but you can do it. And people have done much harder things and, you know, the impossible is possible. And then the day that I finished was the day Josh called me. He called me about an hour later and he goes, hey, I got a job. And it was going to be in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, which is a good hour drive, you know, away. But it was, at least it was something. And so I think that day I got, I got brave and I said, you know, I'm going to just tell Tom, thank you. I had been following him, but I hadn't friend requested him yet, but I was just following along just kind of seeing what he was about. If he was the same person, you know, on social media as he was in the book and he was, and, and I messaged him and I said, you know, this, your book saw me through the worst year of my life and the worst part of it. And I just want to say thank you. And I think he responded with something like, that's great. What response from me would get you to sign up for my lessons and let me take you deeper into that? And I went, huh? <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, ah, you know, I'm not sure we can afford to spend the money on it. We don't even have a paycheck yet. And but at the same time, there was this part of me that knew that in order to rebuild from the zero that we were at, we needed a lot more help than what we had available to us at that time. And there was definitely a part of me that understood that what I had thought was possible before was absolutely so limited and small-minded. And now there was this opportunity to become so much more in the athletic world, um, the physical world for me. And then, of course, our wealth building, like, I mean, all of our savings was gone. All of our retirement savings was gone. I mean, we're 35 and 40. You know, I'm like, we've got a lot of work to do really fast if we're going to be, you know, okay in the couple, you know, next couple of decades. And so I, I looked at my husband and I said, Tom says we need to sign up and we've got to do it as a couple. Well, let me ask you, did you originally think uh, when, when when you talked to Tom about him wanting you to sign up, were you thinking, oh, man, this is, he just wants my money? A, a little bit, but I think intuitively I was like, there's something about the way that I responded to that book that was just, I couldn't get away from it. And even though it was a little bit of money, and, and then Tom was like, look, I'll discount it for you guys. Here's this. And I'm like, we've got to do this. And my husband goes, when we have the money, we will do that. And I looked at him and I said, I don't think we will get the money unless we do it. And we were at a complete 
in Passover that. I well, waited. Well, let me guess who won. Mm-hmm. So I, I waited for the Josh to get paid on his first paycheck, and I signed up for the lessons, and I texted Tom, and I said, Geronimo. That was all I said. And he goes, did you do it? You know, and then he went and looked at it, and he goes, yeah, we're going to do this. I think, I mean, he probably wasn't that enthusiastic because he's Tom, but, you know, it, it, and so we started, you know, he coached us personally, and we started doing his fear challenge and the 21-day challenges that he does, and and then his walk was in October. And, you know, I'm like, there's no way that I'm going to be physically fit, ready to go on a 24-hour walk with my arthritis. But I I kind of surrendered to it. And I thought, well, I just, I know this in my bones. Like, I just, we have to go, no matter what it, tell, what it costs us. And, you know, he, it's not cheap to go up there and do that. He doesn't want it to be cheap because he wants you to have something that, skin in the game, you know, so that you continue and, and finish what you start. And... Josh looked at me, he's like, you're crazy. There's no way we'll have the money to go up there and do that. Not only did we have the money, but it was, it. it Josh had recorded this little EP uh, recording like 10 years ago that all of a sudden somebody with his last name, like kind of got famous and he, his, because of the same name, like it got roped into a playlist and all of a sudden his music took off and he had a royalty check. And I was like, now we have the money to go. I said, we're going on that walk, baby. And he's like, all right. And he hadn't really gotten on board with me yet. You know, he was kind of thinking... Jen's kind of on a high, on a kick with the Navy SEALs. She's writing this book, and they're and they were inspiring. I mean, their ethos is never quit. It's never out of the fight. It's you know, it's your training is never complete, and you just keep going, no matter the obstacle. You keep going, and I really like that, and that was very encouraging for me. And so I really wanted to go, and he was on there with me. And I think he came just because I begged him to. And on the walk, he's like, now I get it. When we finished that walk together, I was like, no matter what we've gone through, not only can we survive, but we can thrive in it and we can build this life that we've always wanted. And we don't have to live for the weekend anymore. We don't have to live for tomorrow. We get to do it today. Based on everything you've been through, what advice do you give to people that are going through tough times? I mean, based on what you've been through, what you've learned, what can you tell people that are, that are listening now, that are struggling, what advice can you give them? I think the life advice that I would give would be to lead a life worth imitating, to embrace failure. If you failed at something, it means you tried something new and to own your own life. We had made mistakes for sure that we could have maybe insulated ourselves a little bit better from having the financial hardship that we went through. And like when we look back on that, we, we can see that mistake again, you know, and then we can make sure that we're not making that mistake going forward. And to inc- accept that, to, that it's not a negative, it's just a learning experience. And, you know, I started with my kids when they'd pick them up from school. I said, well, what did you fail at today? And the first time I did that, my kids like flipped out. Like I was, you know, like they, they thought that was horrible of me to ask them. And I said, well, if you failed at something, it meant that you tried something new and you learned something new. You know, I flipped failure on its head and said, this is a positive thing. And it got to the point where my kids were getting in the car going, guess what? I failed at today, Mom. So my, my kids had successfully kind of conquered their dyslexia. I mean, they're always going to be dyslexic. It's always going to be a struggle. But they understand how to read, and they read for fun. I catch my kids reading underneath their blankets with a flashlight all the time. And so that love for reading because they, they've learned that a hard thing isn't a bad thing. And... You know, and when we embrace those hard things, we learn to be very passionate about something. We learn to be very good at it. And even if we fail at it, it's no big deal. It's just a failure. It's just we learn something new. You know, when, when especially when you start doing all your physical stuff, and the, you know, the, uh, or being the triathlete, you know, especially with the rheumatoid arthritis, I know it's got to be painful. How is it, do you internally, how are you able to push through it? I'm going to have to use a cliche on that one because it's actually what it goes through in my head is embrace the suck. For me, I have it under control very well. I have flare-ups. And so when I have a flare-up, it's just, it's just a sign that I have to slow down and listen. And I have to acknowledge that the arthritis is there, but I'm not necessarily limited by it. And so I might have to go slower. I might have to pull back my training and give myself more time to recover, um, give you some idea of what that was like. The, on the walk, most people recover within 48 hours. For me, it was three weeks. I could not stand up straight. I could not fully extend my joints. Uh, Just the swelling was just that bad. And I was, you know, I did it again in a heartbeat because of what it gained me. And so, yes, it cost me. It was painful. But once you kind of surrender to the fact that, yeah, it's going to be painful, it stops being an obstacle. It's just something that's going to be there and you can keep going. And the running is not my friend. But one of the things that I learned is that I get to be a triathlete and not be the best runner. And if I need to, I can walk the whole damn course. 
and I can go as slow as I need to, you know, as long as it's not a timed, you know, most of them are not timed out. And uh, cycling and, and swimming is wonderful exercise for arthritis patients. And the best thing you can do is move. There is a, a level of, oh, I don't want to move my joints today. They're stiff. They do not want to feel like, they just don't feel like they want to work. And, you know, the more you move, the better that becomes. One of Tom's teaching is to learn to think big, you know, and to think much bigger out of it and to stop looking at the excuse or the, or the limitation and to just set something very large, to set a big goal and then go after it. The, the plan isn't the goal, the outcome is. Do you have, I mean, what's your philosophy on life? What do you want out of life? Hmm. I guess it would be to be great at life now and not tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. And you know, I think when I wrote my book, that was something that was so obvious to me was this little beautiful little girl could be gone in an instant, you know, and my child could be gone in an instant. And my life was gone in an instant, you know, like what we thought we were moving towards was just obliterated. And just look at today. What can you do today? How can you move your needle forward? And, you know, sometimes you know, it, it gets hard and, and you're not quite sure and your day kind of gets obliterated too. And then you just, okay. When you wake up, you, you start from zero that day. It doesn't matter if you feel the day before you just, what can you do today that moves you closer, moves you forward? Well, hey, so what's the name of your book? It is called A Time to Serve, Never Lie, Never Settle, Never Quit. And if somebody wants to buy your book, where where can they get it? Available everywhere. So I always say, make sure to check with your local bookstore first to support your local skies. Um, they can they can order it through Ingram, and the name is Jennifer Widemeyer Smith, W I D E M I R E. Um, that's important because there's like a million Smiths, and they can order it for you. And if you're willing to wait, and if you're not willing to wait, well, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, Amazon have it. <laughs> All right, so Jennifer and I do this with all my guests. I want to give you the parting shot, you know, something we hadn't talked about yet. This is your time to dig down deep. The floor is yours. I think the more hard things you do, the better life becomes. And the, the more passion you can find for anything that you think you might be interested in, the harder it is, the better it makes your life. Well, Jennifer, thanks so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you here, and um, we really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thanks so much. And oh, buy the book, too, you know, obviously. It's awesome. <laughs> This episode with Jennifer Smith is what Rocket Motivation is all about. Love her story of someone who's been pushed to her limit and did not break. It's just amazing. Another episode of Rocket Motivation is in the books. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the show. If you're interested in getting my book, Get Back Up, just go to Amazon and put in Get Back Up and my name, Rod Caden, it'll pop right up. I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast and rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it if you'd share it with a friend. I would like as many people to hear my message as possible. And we'll see you next week. Never give up and always get back up.